Welcome to the Grad School Femme Touring Podcast, the place for first-gen students of color to prepare for grad school. This is Dr. Yvette Martinez Bu, and I will be serving as your Femme Tour, providing you with tips and tricks and everything else you need to know to get into and successfully navigate grad school. For over 10 years, I've been helping first-gen students of color get into top grad programs in their field, and I'm really excited to support you on your academic journey too. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Grad School Fem Touring Podcast. This is your host, Dr. Yvette, and today we have an episode all about guiding Latinx students in grad school. And specifically, I've got the co-authors of the newly published Latinx Guide to Graduate School. I'm so excited to have you both here. Our guests today are Dr. Magdalena Barrera and Dr. Genevieve Negron Gonzalez. Dr. Magdalena is an author, educator, and university leader with 18 years of experience in higher education. A former first-gen college student, she is an expert in diversity, equity, and inclusion, particularly within Hispanic-serving institutions. Magdalena's publications and speaking engagements explore navigational pathways and professional development for first-gen and historically underserved scholars. Dr. Genevieve is an associate professor in the School of Education at the University of San Francisco. She's an interdisciplinary scholar of education and immigration. Her research focuses on the educational and political lives of undocumented young people, deportation, immigrant families, and violence at the border, and the educational navigations of Latinx communities. Welcome to the show, Doctoras Magdalena and Genevieve. Thank, Thank you so much for having us. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like just going, yay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I would love for both of you to get us started by sharing. I know this is a big question, but just whatever you feel comfortable sharing. A little bit about your backstories um, or testimonials. Essentially, how did you get to where you are today? And we can start with whoever is ready to start. <laughs> okay, okay. Genevieve was pointing to me, so that, that okay. means I, I got to go first. So again, thank you so much for the invitation to, to join you here today. Um, you know, again, my name is Magdalena Barrera. I am the granddaughter of Mexican immigrants to the U.S. Midwest. And I grew up in a predominantly white suburb of Chicago. Um, I was, as you mentioned, a first-gen college student. Um, you know, I went to the University of Chicago, but part of my story in getting there was, you know, my mom was someone who really um, pushed me to pursue, you know, my education and take that very seriously. And she always used to tell me, because you're a woman and because you're a minority, you need to earn at least a master's degree. Now, she would tell me this because she worked at a laboratory that was affiliated with the University of Chicago, and she saw people being treated really differently when they had advanced degrees versus people who didn't. And so she wanted, you know, for me to have advantages like that. But, you know, being the first in your family to explore that pathway, you really don't know what that means or um, how to get there. You know, so I went to University of Chicago. I majored in English because I was aspiring to be a novelist, but I also found my way to Latin American studies as a second major um, because that was giving me the histories of colonialism and race that I knew had shaped my family story, but that none of my other curriculum that I had ever um, experienced had ever introduced me to. So I found, you know, academic culture to be very jarring um, many times. In particular, um, you know, I, I went into college wanting to be a writer, but came out with terrible procrastination on my writing, feeling like I was never measuring up. It, higher ed started to slowly kind of chip away at my confidence and love of writing. Um, what helped me get through that experience was being connected to what's today called the Mellon Mays Undergraduate Fellowship Program, right? It's to help identify underrepresented students who could do well in pursuing doctoral degrees in fields where they're underrepresented. Um, so that gave me the <clears throat> opportunity to do my first, you know, major research project, to be connected with a faculty mentor in Curtis Mades, who was the only Latino professor in the English department in my time at uh, University of Chicago. And, and being part of a Latino student group was really like, those were my gente on campus, the people who kind of sustained me day to day. Um, I took a year off after undergrad and then continued in my PhD program um, at Stanford. It's called Modern Thought and Literature, an interdisciplinary program. I wanted to study 
and I ended up studying uh, representations of Mexicans in early 20th century American literature, music, and photography. It was a way for me to understand the world that my grandparents had experienced when they first came to the U.S. and how they were seen. Um, and so, you know, we could talk, you know, more about this, but, you know, when I was in grad school, I did really well while I was in classes, having the structure set out for me, but really felt like I was floundering when it was time for me to work on my dissertation and be more um, kind of self-driven to the point where I almost left academia when I was wrapping up. Um, I didn't think that I was going to be successful if, you know, as a professor, you have to teach and my teaching hadn't been that stellar and you have to write and writing was proving to be very painful. So I thought, what have I just been training for the past seven years for? But I found my way into a teaching postdoc that got me inspired to consider pursuing a faculty career at teaching centered institutions. So that's how I landed at San Jose State in 2008. I was very fortunate um, to land here. I was tenured and promoted to associate in 2014 and became the first woman in my department's 50-year history to be promoted to full professor and elected to serve as department chair. I could say in my time here, uh, which to be real says more about um, the challenges that women of color face in higher ed and not necessarily my exceptionalism or anything. Um, but I've learned so much from my students, my colleagues here, and I've begun to focus my research through their influence, the impacts they've had on me into how we navigate higher education as historically underserved scholars. Um, and in 2020, I was invited to become part of a academic affairs leadership team. I'm now the vice provost for faculty success. I oversee all the faculty hiring, onboarding, getting faculty through their different career milestones. And I'll wrap up by saying it's really meaningful to be in a leadership role where now I am in a position to guide others through the structures of the university. It's a very applied work, which I think really suits my Virgo nature. Mm -hmm. And I also head up HSI initiatives for our institution. And that also has kept me really connected as part of a team of very committed colleagues, um, just very grounding. We're very focused on student success. And that's where I find the meaning of staying in higher education. And I'll turn things over to Genevieve. Um, I always loved, and no matter how many times I hear um, my Belinda share her story, I always love um, just hearing it, and I, I hear new things each time, and I'm struck by the places where there are similarities, and then there are places where there are real differences. Um, so, yeah, you know, I um, I grew up on the U.S.-Mexico border um, in um, South San Diego County, so just um, the, like I said, the very south part of the of the county, which is right, you know, butts right up along the the border. And I always start my story there because so much of who I am and, and what I've done and where I come from traces back to growing up there at that particular moment of time in that space. Um, this was like, you know, I was a teenager in the 90s um, and uh, this was a period that was really, you know, marked by really heightened attacks on immigrant communities. Um, there was, I mean, I could, I could talk for 20 minutes about just that alone. But there was this very particular moment on the border um, that um, was the period of time when I was like, you know, 13, 14, 15 years old. And so I began to get involved in, um, in political work. My understanding of what it meant to be involved in political work at that time was like, electoral stuff, voting, right? That was my only conception for like what, how change happened was through voting. Um, so I got involved in like very mainstream political work um, related to immigrant rights work and sort of political engagement and voting registration um, in Latino communities. And that period really fundamentally shaped sort of my own understanding of the world, my own conception of myself in that understanding of the world, um, and, and, you know, at a fundamental level, shape my, my political consciousness. Um, I uh, was also uh, a first-generation college student. I have an older sister, so she sort of paved the way um, two years before me, but the, the two of us were the first in our family to go to college. Um, and I went to UC Berkeley. I landed there in the midst of a um, very heightened uh, political uh, and uh, racial context. Uh, I, I was among the last classes admitted um, with affirmative action policies to the University of California. I started in the fall of 1996, which meant that I was just on, on that very tail end of affirmative action, which was outlawed through Proposition 209 in California. And um, what that meant is that I like was, you know, 17 years old, landed on a campus that was enmeshed in in struggle. Um, and, you know, I learned a lot from my classes and from my professors and, and my graduate student instructors, 
But really, a lot of my education that happened when I was in college happened um, because of the political activism that I was involved in. That was like my that was like really, truly my major. That's where I spent most of my time, um, more than my classes and um, and in the library. Um, and so, you know, I. Um, I had a, a different kind of relationship to graduate school than Magdalena shared. You know, I was like, my parents sacrificed a lot to get my sister and I like to college and through college. And I always thought, always thought like that was the end of the road. I never had any conception of anything different, especially being at UC Berkeley in this moment. And I loved my undergraduate years at Berkeley, um, but also uh, I saw the campus really radically change because of the banning of affirmative action during that period of time. And by the time I finished, I was like, yeah, see you later. Like there was no part of me that imagined that I would be back for a graduate degree. I um I graduated. I was working already like 30 hours a week as an undergraduate at a community organization um in Oakland that's called the, the School of Unity and Liberation and you know, I graduated. It was kind of like a, you know, it, it felt like a big deal in my family, but it was also like, I've already been at this job. I've already been working 30 hours a week. Yeah. Put me on the schedule for 10 more hours, even though I've already been working more than that, you know, and, um, and there was no part, you know, I, that this was my, this is my path. There was no part of me that thought that I would come to graduate school. And, you know, in a, in a nutshell, I was doing essentially political um, education and grassroots organizing training for young people in the city of Oakland, California. And in that work, some questions started to come up to me about how radical political consciousness is developed among, you know, young people who come from, um, you know, struggling communities, oppressed and marginalized backgrounds. And um, as I was, you know, in this small nonprofit, I was working like an 80 plus hour work week and these questions were coming up in the work and I never had time to mm. to like really fully engage in them. And so when I went back to graduate school, it was not because I was going to be a professor. When I went back to graduate school, it was because I thought, you know, I'm going to go and have some time and some space to be able to like think about and read about and learn about these um these ideas and these and these questions that are coming up. And then I'm going to come back and I'm going to do like the same job that I was doing before. You know, that was that was completely my plan and and I um uh, went to graduate school at UC Berkeley. It was the only graduate program that I applied to because I was like, you know, I'm, I'm, I already had a, a built community here. I felt like that was going to be really critical when I was in graduate school. So I applied to one school. And so for me, it was like, either I'm going to get in and I'm going to probably go, or I'm not going to get in and then I'll, you know, keep on keeping on elsewhere. Um, and um, I ended up getting into graduate school. Um, and then my, my field is education. Uh, I was in a program called the uh, Social and Cultural Studies in Education, which was sort of like a kind of a radical misfit in the school of ed, like where a lot of us were thinking about things, thinking about education, but from a lens of outside of schools and schooling. So I was really looking at, you know, political consciousness and, and political activism as a space for education and, and consciousness raising. Um, you know, to make a very long story short, um, I had two kids when I was in graduate school. I had my son. Um, I, I did a master's PhD, like a, you know, culminating, um, you know, you like your first couple of years, you get your master's and then you continue on in your coursework and it culminates in your PhD. Um, I had my son, um, you know, like probably two weeks after I got my master's degree. I didn't even go to the graduation or anything. I was like, I got other things going on. Um, so uh, my son was born about two years into the program. And then I had my daughter um, four years later um, when I was in the dissertation writing uh, process. And um, and I mentioned that because it's also, you know, very present in the book um, in terms of thinking about, you know, I, I, I felt like I was in a place where um, the expectation was if you had kids when you were in graduate school that you were supposed to, they were supposed to kind of not take up space, like physically, but also like mentally or emotionally. And, um, and my kids, you know, there's two of them and they took up space and they took up space in my life and they took up space in my, in my, um, my own journey through the institution, um, in ways that were, you know, amazing and, and, um, and that really shaped that, that entire experience for me. Um, they're now, you know, very, very big. Um, and so I look back on that time with a lot of fondness. Um, I uh, graduated, I adjuncted for a couple of years at San Jose State in the Mexican American Studies Department. That's where Magdalena and I first became colleagues and friends. Um, and I was also adjuncting at UC Berkeley in a program called Global Poverty and Practice at that period. Um, I adjuncted for a couple of years while I was on the job market. 
and um, ended up landing my position at the University of San Francisco and began there in the fall of 2013. Um, I got tenure, um, went up for tenure early at USF, um, got tenure there, um, and um, recently was promoted to full professor. Um, so I am sort of, you know, hunkered down and continuing my 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 work in the School of Ed. Um, and I'm fortunate to be in a place where there is a um, a real um, uh, respect for kind of uh, the kind of research and work that I'm interested in doing, which is sort of, you know, community engaged and relevant um, on the ground to, to communities um, and um, have, you know, just a stellar group of, of colleagues and, um, and students that I get to work with every day. Well, I want to say first off, felicidades, because I didn't realize I have in your bio, I have you listed as associate professor. <laughs> <laughs> so, All good. It's, let's this get is a it very development. <laughs> <laughs> well, felicidades. And also, I didn't realize that we all had so much in common. Magdalena, I am a fellow Virgo, yeah. <laughs> a former Mellon May fellow, and ah. also got a degree in English for undergrad. <laughs> oh. And Genevieve, I also had, well, I had my first child in grad school, and I'm also a mom of two. So I had my son mm. in grad school, and then my daughter after that. So um, it's it's nice to <laughs> to have some things to bond over. <laughs> so I want to know, um, and I I mean I, I I feel like I have an impression based on my own lived experience of the things that I wish and needed when I was in grad school. But I I want to know specifically the conversations that the two of you had about what inspired you to uh, to create the Latinx Guide to grad school? Um, like, how did you get started collaborating on this project? Because I think that a lot of us who have this experience in higher ed, there's a lot of uh, ideas and there's a lot of things that we say, Let's, we should work on this and this and this, but you both actually got it done. So <laughs> I would love to know what inspired it and, and how did you come to collaborate? You know, I'll jump in and start off by saying that this book is really the culmination of a conversation that Genevieve and I began having a long time ago, like maybe around 2010, I think, is when you joined uh, what was then called Mexican American Studies at San Jose State. Now it's Chicano and Chicano Studies. But that's when we became colleagues. I was like in my second or third year of being an assistant professor. Genevieve was my colleague who was a lecturer teaching in the graduate program. And I remember early on, I got assigned to do a teaching evaluation, so to visit Genevieve's class. And I remember sitting there on the periphery and just watching and just feeling like, oh, my God, like this woman is on fire. Like, I just love everything she's doing. I see how the kind of community she's created in her classroom for the students. And um, I just knew she was someone that's like, hey, this is a really smart mujer that I have a lot to learn from and, and just like want to be engaged with. So we began connecting in that way, really thinking about how do we support um, the students that we shared at that time, supporting their professional development, their intellectual interests, helping them take ownership of the really great ideas and potential that they had and start to make that a reality. Um, so we would always just knock on each other's doors and say, hey, you know, like, this is the feedback I gave to so-and-so. I don't know, like, what do you think? Like, what else can we say to help her develop her project? Or how would you go about this? Um, always just checking in with each other on how to do this. And I'll just say that one thing I that really stuck with me is um, I had a fellowship and spent a year away. And when I came back, Genevieve had developed uh, a series of workshops on that are for first gen Latinx students to help see themselves as writers and to claim a writerly identity and to understand different parts of the writing process. And I just love that she developed this totally on her own, on her own time as a support for the students. When I came back to town, um, we had the idea of having these just kind of writing, um, weekly writing check ins where students could either just come on by, like we're going to be writing in community and let's just work on whatever we're doing together, um, but not be alone in the writing process. But then also if a student had a question about, hey, I'm struggling with my thesis here, or how do I make the leap to this part of my essay, then we're on call to like, hey, let's, we're all here. Let's have a conversation about how to do that. And I just loved that we were working to create spaces of being open about the processes of what we do um, in higher ed. And, and we continued the conversation after Genevieve left for USF. And I'll let you pick up the story from there. 
Yeah. And, you know, I, I think the other part of it in terms of the background is that we both just take teaching really seriously. We take mentorship really seriously. We really loved our students um, and, you know, really saw our responsibility to them in a, in a, in a, in a really clear way. Like, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm spending X number of hours with you when you're in my classroom over the course of this semester. But, you know, we would go home thinking about these students and like, oh man, like, I really love that he's like, you know, like, you know, picking this project and thinking about it in this way, like, how can I support him? And, you know, and, and that comes from a place of just like love for the work that we do, love for the students that we work with and, and a feeling of sort of responsibility around making sure that we are supporting them in, 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 um, in their, their academic pursuits. So, um, so yeah, you know, the continuation sparked there and then continued, you know, at that point we were no longer sharing students, um, but we were, um, you know, in constant conversation with each other, like through email and through text and through, you know, a periodic like cup of coffee or a drink here and there when we were managed to be able to find ourselves in the same city and would um, just like, you know, talk about the work that we were doing to support students and the, the challenges that were coming up for them and how we were thinking about this and the sort of thing. So in a very, in a very real way, we were, you know, just sort of supporting each other as colleagues in thinking about how we support and do this work that, that was so meaningful to us. Um, and then, you know, uh, a few years ago, Magdalena is always better with the dates on it on this than I am. Um, but a few years ago, uh, a colleague of ours, a, a mutual friend, basically, who is a colleague of mine at USF and that we both actually know separately from other parts of our lives. Um, she uh, reached out to both of us um, because she was um, looking for a book that she could give to an incoming graduate student. And she said, you know, hey, I'm just wondering, her name is Kathy Cole. She's in the politics department at the University of San Francisco. And she said, hey, you know, I'm just wondering, do you know of any book that's like for like, you know, a brand new like Latinx student who's entering into graduate school? Like, you know, do you know of anything that exists that I could give as a gift? And I was like, you know, I don't really think I've ever seen anything like that. And she said, OK, well, you know, I'm going to hit up Magdalena as well and see if she has any suggestions. And she was like, yeah, because, you know, I, I knew that if something like that existed, then the two of you would know about it. And, you know, if something like that doesn't exist, like, you, you, you should write that. And we were like, oh, okay, yeah, you know, whatever. Kind of like hung up, hung up the phone. And then, um, you know, she had the same conversation with Magdalena. The two of us, you know, ended up chatting and, hey, did Kathy mention that to you? And yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, what is, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, that sounds kind of good, you know? And so we agreed to sort of sit down and, 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 you know, share a meal and a cup of chai and, like, begin the process of, like, you know, really, truly batting around the idea when we first sat down for that first conversation, it was like, let's get together for lunch. And then we'll see. Well, let, let's just talk about this and see if, if there's, it feels like there's something there. And basically, by the time the lunch was over, we had like a table of contents, the thing was like mapped out, we were talking timeline. Um, so the project really came to be, you know, really from our, our, our mutual, um, our mutual, um, you know, passion for supporting students, also feeling like we were having the same conversation over and over again with students. They would hit this particular mile, you know, milestone and hit this particular set of challenges. And then we would have this conversation. And then, you know, two weeks later, you'd have the same conversation with somebody else. And we were feeling like, you know, it would be really helpful if there was a way that one, we could help students anticipate what was to come. Um, and two, to talk in a really honest and explicit way, like we do in the in the safety of our office. In a lot of ways, the book is like, it's like basically if, if you were sitting with us in the safety of our offices with, you know, um, that 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 sort of real talk kind of conversation. That's what we aspired to do, and it and it came. Um, I don't know. It came pretty easily in that sense. Yeah. yeah. I I feel like that it's it's such a beautiful story of how the seed got planted for the book in terms of both of you already knowing each other, and then someone who you both have in common realizing that wow, this is something that like both of yeah. you could bring in your strengths. Uh, to, uh, that's why I'm not surprised that you got together and we're like, whoop, there's the, <laughs> there's, there's the, the outline or the table of contents, you name it. I'm curious though, as you were starting the project, how did each of your like research backgrounds and your, I guess, um, yeah, your, your previous experience, like whether it's your research or your DEI work, how did these things inform the book uh, or shape the book in some way? 
Um, so, you know, I, I, something that's another kind of uh, commonality between us that's sort of funny is that both of us are sort of higher ed scholars by accident <laughs> in a lot of ways. Um, you know, I never, I never sought to, 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 um, to specifically focus on higher ed in my work. Um, but when I was doing my research work, I, you know, I, 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 um, was working uh, on my dissertation. My, my dissertation focuses on, uh, the political consciousness of undocumented young people and, um, and in a lot of ways, you know, coming to that work was like coming home to my own like political, you know, sort of um, um, origins in terms of the border and that sort of thing. Um, but what what undocumented young people were were rallying around at that period of time in the early 2000s was the DREAM Act. And so I ended up looking at higher ed because the students were focused on the question of access to higher ed. Um, but, you know, I think that it's a really interesting question, and, and I don't know that anybody's actually asked us this specific question um, to this point, but as I was thinking about it, you know, there's really two things that come to mind for me. The first is, is that, you know, I think um, thinking about and writing about and working with undocumented students um, for the better part of the past, you know, 20-ish years at this point um, have meant that um, the question of access to higher education um, has been at the very forefront of my of my uh, thinking, and in particular, thinking about the ways that structural forces um, shape educational opportunities, basically. Um, and there's very clear ways in which that plays out for undocumented young people who are who are seeking a path to higher education. Um, but it also means that the ter in terms of sort of the question of access to higher education and the way that sort of the institution is not set up to foster that kind of access, the ways in which even in a place like California, where there is, you know, um, institutional support for undocumented students, there are still really, really profound barriers. Um, and so thinking about the question of sort of the way that structural forces shape educational opportunity is something that has been at the forefront of my thinking for, for a lot of um, years because of, because of my own research background and my focus. Um, and then the second thing is that, you know, I think one of the things that I, that I you know, I'm, I'm, I'm somebody who has studied and written about undocumented young people, but in a lot of ways, the way that I think about that is that I've learned from undocumented young people and had the opportunity to learn from undocumented young people over the course of the past um, almost 20 years. And and one of the things that has always stuck with me and that has been true in all the contexts in which I've done this research, four-year colleges, undocumented young people outside of school, undocumented students at community colleges, undocumented students at Jesuit universities, you know, one of the things that has remained true in all of those spaces um, time and time again is that I've really learned from undocumented students that it is a critical importance and it's one's responsibility to always be looking behind you, right? That you are always looking for who's coming behind you mm -hmm. and how you are able to use your foothold to hold that door a little bit further open. Um, and thinking about the ways that even, you know, when you don't have very much yourself, that it's your responsibility to think about how do I split this in two and share with somebody else? Um, and, and I say that in that way, because I think for us, you know, in a lot of ways, I think, um, you know, there, there, there was probably, uh, parts of me that felt like, I, well, I can't, I can't write this book. Like, what do I know about graduate school? Just like, just that I got through graduate school doesn't mean that I actually know anything about graduate school. But I think that what I've learned from working with undocumented young people is that like, even when you're still figuring it out as you're going through, like you have to be constantly thinking about how you support the next crew of folks who are coming up behind you. So um, those are the things that, that, that I think for me have, um, have shaped my own engagement in this. And just to build on that, you know, thinking about how, the effort we made to try to make this book as comprehensive as possible, you know, the starting point was that it's co-authored, right? And so, right, as we kind of touched upon before, uh, Genevieve and I shared some of the same uh, challenges getting through grad school. I think that's some of which are very common to many historically underserved students, but we also had different, really different experiences in many ways, right? And different areas of strength that we brought to that experience. And so in the book, we really aim to include a lot of uh, personal anecdotes, stories, just to exemplify some of the things we're trying to talk about and be real about, we had a lot to figure out, you know, at, at the time. And I think also that stems from just being mindful of the diverse backgrounds and interests of the many students whom we've mentored over the years, just knowing, right, that Latinx is a very broad umbrella for many very distinctive experiences and to never um, you know, just assume that there's right the one way to be or all Latinos are into X, Y, Z, you know, that's that's not how we are. Right. And so that was one thing. Another is 
we organized a process for soliciting feedback on the first full draft that was really powerful. So each of us invited five former student, former or current students and five colleagues. So 10 students total, 10 colleagues total, who drew from their experiences in reading that manuscript to point to additional topics that could be helpful to say, hey, I, you, you talk about this, but you didn't go into as much detail about that. And, and I think that could be really critical. Um, you know, that led to one big chapter turning into two separate ones. I think the focus is just much better on those now. Uh, some of them also contributed consejos from their experiences. So it's just added to the voices in the book. Um, Genevieve contacted uh, our colleague Carolina Valdivia, who wrote a really excellent FAQs for undocumented students. So again, just thinking about like, we've been through this, but there's other parts of the experience that we have less familiarity with, but we want to be able to represent in this meaningful way in the book. Um, right down to the cover art. Um, it was really a pleasure to work with Adriana Arriaga. Um, she goes by Adriana La Artista, who's a former student of mine at San Jose State, um, has an MFA. Um, wanting to work with her to design a cover that would capture the diversity of Latinx experiences. So thinking about the graduation caps that students decorate, just making sure it's not just like only Mexican themed because that's our backgrounds, right? That Adriana, Genevieve and I share. So just thinking through it all in that way. I mean, really the message in the book is there's no one right or wrong way to be Latinx, even down to the Spanish that we incorporate into the book. Like there's a note about like, Hey, not a, all of us grew up speaking Spanish and it, the book it's in there not to make you feel bad if you're like grew up, you know, in an English dominant household, but rather to have a political message to the book and to center like these oppositional ways of speaking back to the university. Right. So there's no one way to be Latinx and there's no one way to do grad school. Um, right. From where you choose to go to the kind of focus, uh, the program that you end up going to, whether you stay close to home or not, how you apply your degree afterwards. It's like, here's just a bunch of things to think about as you figure out your journey, the pathway that's right for you. Just because we made particular choices doesn't mean that that was the best or the only way to do that. And, you know, now that the book is out, um, we, you know, we're really proud of everything that we managed to include in it. But we had a conversation early on with um, a grad student who was sharing um, a part of her journey, which was um, choosing to stop out for a time of her graduate program. And we realized, oh, man, we didn't even talk about that in the book, you know, so it's like, the more that's out there, it's you realize, God, like, we could have added this, we, we forgot to talk about this. So even when it's done, you realize, no, it's not quite done, because there is so much in this experience and so many different pathways through. Oh, yeah. Um, I appreciate the intentionality behind um, your messaging, both with what um, it, what you provided within the content, the research, the writing, how you solicited feedback, how you integrated others within the cover and even writing certain sections of the book. That's amazing. And I, I, uh, <laughs> I can relate to the feeling with um, drafting a book myself of of like not being able to fit everything in, you know, of like, oh, but like, there's so many things that can come up um, for Latinx students, and especially uh, first gen Latinx students. I'm wondering for for both of you, what were some of the challenges? Because there's a reason why not a lot of folks are able to publish books. It, it is a big endeavor. And so what were some of the, the, the challenges that, that came up for you? And are there any strategies in particular that helped you overcome them? I mean, I think the main, the main challenge is that the vast majority of this book was written over the pandemic. Um, <laughs> oh. And yeah, so, um, you know, I, um, I, I literally, for my portions of the book, I literally wrote them in like 20 minute chunks really the entire, the entirety of the way through in 20 minute chunks while my kids were like, you know, flank beside me, one in fourth grade, one in ninth grade, um, learning at home, like, you know, making sure, okay, oh man, did your Zoom disconnect? Okay, what, okay, where's your thing? What are you looking for? Whatever. Okay. You know, um, you know, and I, and I, and I say it that way because, you know, I didn't have a three-year-old at home. That would have been a really different thing, you know, um, but I, um, I, Remember thinking in the beginning of the writing process, okay, how is this, how is this potentially going to derail this project? 
And, and I had a, a bit of a more, I'm, I'm married to a registered nurse um, who works at a county hospital. So mm-hmm. I had a pretty clear sense that this was, I, you know, other people are I saw like, you know, were like, oh, we're, the kids are going to be out of school for two weeks. I was like, the kids are going to be out of school for two weeks. <laughs> I, I knew, you know, had a pretty clear, realistic sense of like how bad this was going to be. Maybe not how bad, but that it was going to be quite bad from the beginning. Um, and so I knew this was going to be months long. I knew that my kids were not going to return to school after spring break, you know, um, and I remember thinking early on, like, okay, how, how is this going to derail this? Or what is going to be derailed in this process? And there were things in my life that did get derailed in the process of the pandemic, but I decided that this wasn't going to be one of them. Um, And I knew that I would be able to write in 20 minute chunks. And I knew that I would be able to, you know, and, and in in many ways, you know, co-authoring something is harder because you're like, you know, you're like, you're moving other limbs that are not your own. Um, (laughs) Like, you know, I mean, sometimes co-authoring is really, really hard. Um, And then sometimes the fact that you're co-authoring makes actually everything so much easier. And this project was for that, for me that, right, is that I knew that Magdalena was also plugging along at home. I knew that she would, you know, so we were like checking in and sending emails and like, you know, catching each other here and there as like everything was spiraling wild out of control. Um, But like the fact that we were both kind of plugging ahead and we had this timeline and we kept to it and we were, you know, and in in a lot of ways, it, it became something that felt like, you know, in as everything was so scary and so hard in the world broadly and and um and having a frontline healthcare worker in my house like this was one of the things that I was like okay we can do this one step at a time you know and that's that's so to me that that's both the challenge and also sort of how we we dealt with it I also want to mention that um that we worked with a really fantastic editorial team mm-hmm. at, um, at Duke University Press. And I think that for folks who might be listening to this and are interested in, in doing something similar, um, you know, I think having a good editor who really, really understands your work and is not trying to make it into something else and who's ex- as excited as you are mm-hmm. about the project from the beginning. Um, we, you know, worked with um, 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 Latina uh, editorial staff at Duke. And that made all the difference. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'll just say part of my favorite story about how the book came about is in part that, you know, we started meeting in 2018 was when we had this like big lunch date of, you know, brainstorming what topics would be included. And in. they, like we were mentioning earlier, the pieces came together so clearly like, oh, we would want to cover one, two, three, four, five. And, and this is, could be the order they go in. And so we initially started drafting a, book proposal and the intro chapter. And Genevieve had the opportunity to meet up with our editor, um, Gisela Fosado at Duke University from another book project she was um, working with Gisela on, and also co-authored um, book. And, um, you know, we initially had been thinking to go with very different type of press. We didn't imagine that a typical university press would be interested in a book like this, because it was, you know, it's really different than the typical academic monograph. And Genevieve, you know, was just picking her brain and said, oh, we've, I've got this other project I'm working on. And Hisela was so great, right? And I believe she told you, like, hey, send, let me take a look at it first before you send it to that other press. And she read what our prospectus and the first chapter. And she was like, I'm really behind this project. So just that was such an amazing boost of confidence. Like, OK, we're not the only ones that see the value in this or, you know, are going to be championing this project. So that released some of the pressure of having the book contract. And it was also good for me in two ways. One, working with an experienced uh, co-author who had worked, collaborated with other colleagues on other books. So it's like her familiarity with the publishing process. This is my first book, really provided me with a lot of guidance and understanding of what the stages would be. But then also um, Genevieve is someone who is just a delight to work with. There was a lot of trust in our process that I will say really helped me push past my typical procrastination that I developed way back in 1993 at the University of Chicago. And it's been going for like 30 something years. Like, you know, how I, I don't know how I've made my way through tenure and promotion, like through grad school, through tenure and promotion, like writing has always been very slow and painful for me, but it's changing now. And this experience of co-authoring has been really revelatory for me because uh, I will say Genevieve helped us set really aggressive internal deadlines that I met, I pushed myself to meet as best I could because I did not want to let her down 
in part because she was still going through her promotion process for full. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. I am not going to be the one who sat on something and then let a major milestone, like some, a major project not count towards her next milestone. Right. So it's like, I can't live with that. I'm not going to do that. But also Genevieve is someone who really modeled for me, just like getting the first draft done, like type it out, like share it. You know, I'm so reserved with my writing and like, oh my God, like, what are people going to say? Is this pretty enough? Whatever. And Genevieve would say, uh, okay, I'm going to work on my part of that chapter and I'll have it in there by the end of the week. And then like by Friday, I get a message saying, okay, it's in there. Tell me what you think. And it was like, oh damn, I better uh, spend, the rest, spend the rest of today right now by half that I was supposed to have. It was just, it was just good. It got me out of my own mind. That was my biggest challenge. And my biggest challenge as a writer is being too long alone, ruminating and not talking out the ideas, just being like, Hey, does this land is does this communicate what I'm trying to have it communicate and having a lot of trust because right. There were times when I'm like, all right, I, I added this in and Genevieve would say, Oh, I don't know if that really works. And it's like, okay, cool. Like we're, I, we have a vision that we're working towards. I'm not afraid of feedback. Like we're going to do something really great here and we have to be in partnership and clear communication to achieve it. You know, that's really great. I, I wish that more folks were taught how to write in collaboration because you learn so much from other folks and how they navigate their writing process. It's it's really a great exercise. You mean, especially if you, the reason why it was like so amazing to me is because I come from an academic field of literary studies where things are mostly solo authored. So yeah. it feels like a lot of pressure on you as the writer to come up with the whole book, right? So this was really great because, and I've had some other really key co-authoring experiences in recent years that have really turned around my feelings about writing and my approach to it. So, right, in some fields, it, it comes as a matter of course, but even there, it's not to say it's not rife with competition and hierarchy mm-hmm. and toxicity. So it's it's something to do as well about the trust in the relationship and having a shared common goal for the political and applied purpose of the project. Right. I, right. I absolutely agree with that. And I, I also just think that, you know, it's, it's when we, when we began writing, it was like, it, it really did feel like it was like pouring forth. I mean, the, the manuscript mm-hmm. actually came in, like, was it 20,000, Magdalena, 20,000 words over, yeah. um, over like the goal <laughs> and we sent it into the editorial team at Duke and 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 as Magdalena mentioned Gisela Fosabo has been really really incredible I also want to mention um Alejandra Mejia who also was um was support editorial support on the project and when we submitted it I was you know I'd heard horror stories about people like submitting things that were too long to the press you know after like a you know we, I mean we had a written contract you know and like and then the press coming back and being like you got to cut 20,000 words or whatever, you know, so we kind of submitted them. We're like, like a little bit <laughs> nervous, you know, and I was like, do I acknowledge it? Do I, not? I, I guess I got to acknowledge it. So you're not going to not notice 20,000 extra words, you know? <laughs> and, um, and so I kind of, you know, acknowledged it when we submitted and then Gisela and, um, and Ale replied and we're like, you know, I don't think there's anything that can be cut. This looks fantastic, you know, which was like, Ooh, okay, you know, and and um and just I think the the process of of collaborating in that way and and feeling like yeah actually this is this is the collective offering that we have just felt really good to get it out in the world. Well, one last thing I'll say is I wonder if we dazzled them because thanks to Genevieve's timeline setting, we got our full manuscript revised back to the press something like four months ahead of time. And I remember he sent us email said, I'm still trying to pick my jaw up off the floor um, because this <laughs> like never happens. And so maybe that dazzled them. And they were like, maybe they didn't notice the extra 20K words until they see this podcast. And then they'll be like, oh man, we should have, uh, should have counted that better. <laughs> That's too funny. <laughs> we are getting close to wrapping up, but I, I want to ask another question about, about what your hopes are for the, the book, uh, its impact, how it will be received or is being received by others in, in the wider academic community. So I, I'm like, what are your hopes and dreams for the book? Especially now it's out. So you're seeing some of these things come to fruition, I can imagine. Well, I'll jump in and say that I just really hope, my hope for the book is that people who find their way to it or who receive it from someone will feel the love and sincere cariño that we poured into it from the start. That was what was in our hearts. 
um, right? We, people have said it don't feel, feels like having two tias or madrinas sit you down and like just open up and, and share their experiences and like storytelling, like around cafecito and fun, you know? And so I'm proud of that aspect of the book. And, you know, it's interesting, something that's been on my mind is there are real critiques out there, valid critiques about academic navigational how-to books that can be problematic at times because, right, folks can say, well, what do they really do to change the inequities, the structures, that are that are very toxic and harmful to navigate and that wear us down at times. And so to be very clear, we wrote this in the hopes that, as Genevieve said earlier, that we push the door open further with our toehold so that more of us can join the effort to remake the academy for the better. So it's not to get you through so that you do the same thing to other future students that were done to you, but it's no, like we're going to re-envision ways of being in the academy because we're going to more holistically bring our cultural values, our ways of being into the daily work of the institution. So it's really, you know, a mo I hope too, it'll serve as a model for how we open up these navigational pathways for continued transformation. So people have already asked us, when are you going to write the Latinx guide to undergrad or the Latinx guide to the professoriate? And so now maybe you've got like a whole the, the uh, series of books. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to talk Genevieve into maybe thinking about the professoriate one with me. <laughs> the, trilogy, the trilogy of books. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I share so much of what of what Magdalena shared in terms of hopes, um, which I think is why, you know, it, it this this all came together so beautifully is that it it the, the book was written because we had a shared hope for what it could be in the world. Um and the reception has been really great. And, you know, folks have, have shared with us just like different little pieces that have resonated with them. And we had a book event last week and, and um, this like, you know, young woman came up and was like, you know, I heard about your book on TikTok. And I was like, what? <laughs> like not a, not a sentence that I expected ever to, to, to come out, to come out of anyone's mouth. Um, and then my own students are telling me, you know, like, oh, like, you know, when I see posts about your book on Instagram, like I always jump in and say like, that's my professor, and, you know, <laughs> you know, then they're proud to see it out in the world. And, and, um, you know, I think our hope really fundamentally has been all along that when students pick up the book, you know, there's, there's sort of two things. One is that, you know, there's, race is a social construct. It's also fundamentally shapes our lives in ways that like are, 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 are very clear and are undeniable. And yet when we think about like advice for graduate school and things like that, there is this expectation that you're going to like set your identity aside and like, you know, here is, here is how you approach finding a mentor. And, you know, and it's like, and, and, and we wanted students to be able to pick up a book and say like, wow, there's a section on having kids when you're in graduate school. Wow, there's a section on how you talk to your mom who may not understand why you're still in school and may actually be a little bit frustrated that you're not out in the world like earning a real paycheck, right? We wanted to talk about, look, you might have to encounter race, racist and racial um, dynamics in classrooms or with advisors or with professors. Like, and it's not you. And also, here's how to think about this and here's how to approach it, right? And so we wanted... We wanted Latinx students um, or would-be students to be able to pick up a book and be like, wow, this actually really speaks to me. And that helps me situate and contextualize what I'm experiencing and knowing that I'm not alone. Because what so many of us, I think, have is that experience of feeling like, like we're alone and we're the only ones who are doubting in the ways that we are or that are struggling in the ways that we are. And our hope in the book was like being able to document in really clear form it's not only you and it's actually structural and institutional. And also there are ways to navigate this, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I think the other big hope is just that it feels like a collective offering, you know, part of our decision to include the consejos from other colleagues of ours is because our hope is that it really feels to students like when they read this book, that they can really feel this idea that, you know, there, there are many of us who have come before you and we're all cheering you on. We all, you know, we don't know you, but we love you and we believe in you. And we know that we have the capacity to transform the institution. And, you know, this book, our hope is, is, is a reminder of you, for you, that we've come before you on this path. People will come behind you on this path as well. 
and we're all part of this lineage um, and the folks that have come before you believe in you and love you and, 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 and trust in all that you can do. And, and in the moments when maybe you're doubting that yourself, lean on that, you know, as a way to get you through. That's great. I feel like those are really great closing words, but I want to ask, see if Magdalena, have you had any other closing words or Genevieve, anything else that maybe you're like, I didn't get to add this one thing. No, I mean, it's, that's, that's the heart of it really. And it's just been, it's a pleasure to have engaged in this project to now see it out in the world, to see students' reactions, to be talking about it, have opportunities like this to connect with you. Um, Yeah, it's just, all right, the, the retaking of academia starts now. Yes. Like, let's do it. <laughs> yes. So for uh, the folks who are listening to the podcast and who who want to stay in touch or who just resonated and, and want to connect with you in some way, shape or form, what is the best way for them to reach you? I'm kind of terrible on the things that I should be terrible on. I'm terrible on Twitter. I'm terrible on LinkedIn. So, I mean, you can find me on those places, but I don't really actively use them. Um, but also I will say like, I am really, I take my job really seriously and I'm really responsive on email and I get emails from students who are not my students, who are not in my classroom, who are not in my inst- not in my institution, who like reach out for support. And I reply to every single one of them. So um, it's like, yeah, I'm like, I'm like old and grumpy and bad at social media, but um, um, the best way to reach me is through email. Um, I'm easily <laughs> findable on the USF website. It's also my first um, initial and then my last name with no spaces, G Negro Gonzalez at usfca.ed. And I am on a bunch of those platforms and it doesn't mean that I'm any better about them because I had a picture when our books came in and I tagged Genevieve. It turns out it was like a different Genevieve. And then I saw it like it go viral and I'm like, oh man, oh, no. this other person is like, um, I didn't co-author the book with you. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I know that's life. Um so I, the best place to, to find me is very easily is probably on LinkedIn, you know, just under Magdalena Barrera, but also the same as Genevieve. I'm very responsive over email and I'm always happy to connect. And my email is magdalena.barrera at sjsu.edu. And um, just welcome all kinds of contact. If you if you read the book, let us know what resonated with you, uh, how you're maybe sharing it out or applying the advice. If you're interested in, in talking more, um, inviting us to your campus, you know, we're, we're open to considering it. So please just let's keep the conversation going. Well, I want to thank you both, uh, Doctoras, Magdalena, Genevieve, thank you for coming on the show today, for sharing this beautiful, beautiful ofrenda of yours that I know is going to continue to shape and carve a space for Latinx students all over the country. So thank you. Thanks so much for joining me in the Grad School Fem Touring Podcast. If you liked what you heard, here are three ways you can support the show. The first is to make sure you're subscribed and leave a review of the podcast. If you leave me a review on Apple Podcasts, you become eligible for a free half hour coaching session with me. Yes, that's right. One free session. Once you leave a review, you can email me a screenshot and I'll send you a link to sign up. The second way to show your love is to get yourself a copy of my free 15-page grad school fem touring kit, which includes resources on research, organization, grad school, and career prep. Go to gradschoolfemtouring.com slash kit to get it today. The third and last way to support my show is to follow me on social media. I am on Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and occasionally TikTok with the handle at Grad School Fan Touring. Thanks again and until next time.